Welcome to Multilingual World. I'm Dr. Ser Sanya, a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Manchester. I will be hosting this series of podcasts in which we discuss the importance of multilingualism in Manchester and beyond. We also show the importance of language policy and planning in education and socioeconomic development. This series features Dr. Leonie Geiser, a postdoctoral research fellow in linguistic diversity here at the University of Manchester. Her research focus is on urban multilingualism, language maintenance and language provision. And um, she wrote an MA dissertation entitled Manchester's Linguistic Landscape, the Creation of a Representation of Place, and a PhD dissertation entitled Understanding Community in the Global Diaspora, Arabic Language Practices, Maintenance and Provision in Manchester. Hello, Dr. Leonie Geiser. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on uh, multilingualism in the city of uh, Manchester. Hello, Serge. Hello, everyone listening. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this conversation today. I'm delighted. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk about doing research uh, in the city of Manchester. Uh, multilingualism is a key part of your research, right? And uh, your research is actually based in Manchester. But for people who don't know the city, you know, especially those who live abroad, you know, from like countries outside, like Senegal, for example, people might think that doing research in Manchester would probably be equivalent, in language at least, would be equivalent to doing research on English because the perception outside would be that, you know, we are in England, we're in Manchester, so the only language that is spoken would be English, right? So my question here is, how multilingual is Manchester? Um, well, thank you for that question. To, to, I'd say to be able to understand Manchester's multilingualism, we really need to go back in history and remind ourselves that Manchester is one of um, the first industrialized cities in the world. Um, and because of that, Manchester has a very, very long history of migration. And um, that, in a way, is still um, visible today. And of course, very recently, we have had further um, waves of migration for a variety of reasons. And um, today, um, research has shown that there are between 150 and 200 languages, very roughly, um, spoken in Manchester. And um, that's remarkable um, because of the size of the city. When we look at London, for example, we'll find between 250, 300 languages. But of course, we need to remember that London is a city of between eight and nine million. And Manchester is a city of just over half a million. So in that sense, this is very remarkable. And um, we can probably say that it's one of the most linguistically diverse cities in Europe, if we consider the size of it. Um, okay. So if we look at the, the languages that are spoken here, we can find um, languages that are of, of global importance, such as, for example, Portuguese, French, Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, and so on. Um, but we also find what's often called smaller languages um, that are not of global relevance. Um, languages, um, for example, Cantonese or Hakka Chinese or Punjabi, for example. And we also um, find a number of, um, of a very actually strong presence of various African languages, um, such as um, Wolof or um, Edo or Mandinka. And um, the, the city is really characterized by this great diversity of languages. And it's something that we can, we can even see if we, if we walk through the city, um, we can see many languages written on signs, for example. And this is, um, this is a great asset that the city has. Um, I'd like to, if, I'm, if I may, um, add one note in relation to the numbers of languages that I was um, citing before. And it's very important to remember that it's actually very difficult to count languages. 
Um, okay. Often researchers or journalists like to put a number of on, on things, um, but languages are difficult to count just because it's sometimes difficult to, to define boundaries between languages and dialects and so on. And we need to kind of um, rely on, on census data, for example, or other language data sets, and they don't always capture the complexity um, of languages. And um, often speakers are multilingual, and that's not always captured in these language data sets. Um, yeah, that's something to, to keep in mind when, when we compare um, the multilingual character of different cities, for example. So what happens? I mean, we have 150 like over 150 languages, which, you know, would be unbelievable for someone who doesn't know the city. But how do people use those languages in actual, what are the kinds of language practices that you've observed during your research? Well, in my research, I looked at different settings. I looked, for example, at the family setting, where, of course, across generation across generations of migration, there may be differences in the language proficiencies um, across speakers. So uh, the first generation of migration will very often um, continue the use of um, the language that they used to speak in their place of origin, um, but also acquire English here, here in, in the UK um, as the majority language. Um, but then the second and third generations of migration, they might, um, they, they will then be um, fluent or highly proficient in, in English or in, in the local majority language and possibly more and more um, lose the proficiency in, in what's often called the heritage language. Um, part of my research looks at what's often called supplementary or complementary schools. These are um, voluntary sector um, organizations or community institutions um, that have been set up to, to maintain language and elements of culture and to, to pass on often the heritage language to younger generations in the diaspora setting. Um, then, of course, languages are used in business settings that might be um, for commercial reasons, in a way, commodifying the language. For example, if you um, have a Chinese restaurant and you use Chinese on, on your facade, that, that might be for commercial reasons to, to create a sense of authenticity, to attract tourists and so on. But then at the same time, these languages are actually used to communicate to local communities, to communicate to people who, who use those languages, to often create a sense of identity and create a certain link with people um, who might then recognize those languages and, and um, feel a certain um, connection to them. Um, and then a final um, setting or, or area that I've looked at in my doctoral research um, is the, the area of language provisions, for example, interpreting and translation settings. So here the UK is actually quite um, unique in that it provides um, interpreting and translation services free of charge um, to people who need to access any kind of public services, um, such as, for example, healthcare. And... Um, um, I looked at the, the challenges of providing such language services like interpreting and translation um, to such a very multilingual um, and, and diverse population. So if we went a little bit into detail, if we looked at the family uh, setting, for example, how do, um, first of all, what are the expectations from you know, the first generation of migrants? do they try to transmit the heritage language to children and how does it work? Do they manage to maintain you know, the heritage language? Well, that's a very, very good question. And I think it's very difficult to answer um, with one um, answer, if you wish. Um, I, my research focuses on one family. My, research focus, my, my doctoral research focuses on Arabic and the family look, I looked at is uh, a relatively recently arrived um, family um, from Syria who came as uh, refugees to the UK. And um, both parents are highly educated and they um, have immediately recognized the, the importance and need in a way to, to um, help their children um, acquire English so that they can access education and higher education here in the UK. But then at the same time, 
they are somehow balancing this um, aim with the aim to maintain their language, to maintain Arabic and their variety of Arabic. Um, so they are um, this this particular family are. Um, you know they're, they're having, making really great effort to to help their children maintain and um, maintain the written forms of Arabic, but also spoken forms of Arabic. Um, for example, through supplementary schools, but also um, for informal language teaching in the home by using written um, labels of Arabic um, in the kitchen and all around the, the house and so on. So you can see that they're really making a very conscious effort to, to pass on um, Arabic as they're recognizing it as a skill. But you will see other families where um, very often um, as a result of uh, influence from teachers, for example, mainstream schools, um, where um, th there is very often an advice to somehow help children acquire English as quickly as possible, but um, focus on English, but not uh, necessarily help maintain the heritage language, which unfortunately is a myth that's still being spread. And I have spoken to families where um, there is the aim to, to, to speak mainly English in the house, in the home, um, but not um, the heritage language, which is of course a shame. And so if you look at different families, you will find very different scenarios mm -hmm. and um, different uh, factors that in a way influence the families and um, family members' practices. So what we see here is actually the advice they get from um, uh, teachers can actually lead to language shift and assimilation, which means that you know, the consequence is that it cuts you know, the second generation of the heritage language completely. Exactly. Yeah. And this is a very unfortunate situation. And it's something that, for example, our research can, can try and, and work against, um, because research has shown that uh, maintaining the heritage language will also help build um, another, uh, for example, now the diaspora majority language, English. And also, um, we, we see from, for example, social media practices and so on, everything that now, you know, nowadays um, people can, can connect with people around the world and use their languages. And it's so useful and it's become such a skill um, and such an asset also to Manchester, for example, and its international economy and so on. Um, so um, we do see that, that there is a, a big proportion, actually, of, of Manchester's population who, who speak additional languages in addition to English, they are really making efforts to, to maintain um, their heritage languages since they recognize um, the value it has. But if obviously for a linguist, it is clear that speaking, you know, it's possible to speak, you know, or use many languages on a daily basis. I mean, most of us actually do it on a daily basis. We use English, we use our, you know, uh, um, heritage languages, we use other languages that we acquired and that we use in like, you know, some uh, settings or some domains. So it's possible, but obviously for a linguist, it's always hard to convey that message of multilingualism to the general public or to decision makers. You know, so for example, education is one area where, um, it is difficult to uh, convince not only teachers, but also parents and decision makers that it is actually possible for a child to have several languages and function perfectly well. You worked on uh, supplementary schools, which you know um, is a model to actually maintain you know, the uh, heritage language. And in your case, you worked on Arabic. Right, Ar Arabic supplementary school. I think there are more uh, supplementary schools than the Arabic ones. Maybe Somali, the Somali community has uh, supplementary schools. I lived in Montesquieu for a while, so I'm, I've heard more about it, but I haven't done the research on it. The question with Arabic is that first we know that Arabic, you know, is like, we talk about Arabic as if it's just one language and one variety and one small, like, you know, um, not small, but where there is less variation than it, there is actually in reality. 
right? So my question here is, what kind of Arabic is taught in supplementary schools? Does it uh, match the Arabic that is spoken at home in the family you looked at? And uh, I suppose across families and across communities, you know, within the Arabic community, we'll come back to this term actually. Um, there are variations. So you'll have like Syrian Arabic, which will differ from Algerian Arabic, which will differ from Moroccan Arabic and, you know, different types of Arabics. But there is also standard Arabic, right? So which one? Which one do they teach in supplementary schools? Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, thanks also for pointing out this complexity with what we usually refer to as Arabic is really much more than that. As you said, we have um, the, the, the many regional varieties um, that um, are spoken, spread across the Arab world, and they are really sometimes so different from each other that they're not necessarily mutually intelligible. Um, then we have the modern standard variety, that's um, the variety that's often perceived as the most prestigious or one of the more prestigious varieties that's perceived as correct. And modern standard Arabic is also the variety that is typically taught um, and used in official or formal settings in the Arab world. Um, but it's very different from most of the varieties that are acquired naturally, most of the colloquial um, regional varieties spoken in, in, in family homes and so on. And then um, we have to remember that modern standard Arabic is based on the classical um, variety of Arabic, classical variety um, Arabic that's used in the Quran. Um, so that, of course, also has um, a very high level of prestige. Um, and has um, a very central relevance um, to, to religious identities across Muslim communities. So not only those who necessarily use a variety of Arabic in their everyday lives, um, but really um, beyond the Arab world. Um, now your question regarding um, language choice or the target language in supplementary schools. Again, that's, um, that's a question that cannot be answered in a very straightforward way because um, there, is more, there are more than 20 to 25 Arabic supplementary schools in Manchester. And um, each of them has a different practice and approach to, to teach uh, the language or to teaching um, Arabic and its varieties. Um, some schools, um, and most of them actually, um, promote modern standard Arabic and, and select that as their official target language so that they want to pass on the variety or the dialect of Arabic that's perceived as the correct variety and that's perceived as the most prestigious one. And that's in a way also recognized as a skill um, in the UK setting um, because, um, for example, GCSE and A-level qualifications um, for those listeners and viewers who are not familiar with the the UK education system, GCSE and A-level qualifications are um, high school qualifications here in the UK. Um, they can be taken in Arabic and here modern standard Arabic is perceived as the correct variety. So in this sense, uh, modern standard Arabic is recognized as a skill in the UK setting, but then also, of course, in the Arab world, um, where it's used in schools, for example, and in, in, in official settings. Um, now, of course, there is an issue I mentioned before that modern standard Arabic is not necessarily the variety or it's not the variety acquired naturally. It's not spoken in people's homes. And this is the challenge um, for children, for example, growing up in the UK who hear their parents speak um, their regional varieties of Arabic, colloquial forms, non-standardized forms of Arabic that are in many cases very different from modern standard Arabic. And then they use those um, forms of language in the classroom, in the supplementary school, and they're not necessarily recognized or perceived as correct. Um, so this is where different schools have different approaches. You can find schools where most of the teaching takes place in Arabic. So most of the classroom conversations will be in Arabic. <laughs> I'll say I'm, I'm referring to Arabic. And what I mean here is the colloquial forms. Um, while still um, the target language um, in writing, for example, is modern standard Arabic. Um, there are other schools where um, teachers won't necessarily accept 
um, non-standardized forms um, in the classroom. So this is a very tricky situation for pupils, but also for teachers who don't necessarily feel comfortable speaking modern standard Arabic um, in the classroom when they don't also speak it outside the classroom with anyone um, in their daily lives. So, okay, so um, if we looked at um, uh, the use of, you know, uh, Arabic in home, just very quickly, have you ever come across a family that spoke standard Arabic at home? No, and usually if you, if you ask if you ask families about their uses of Arabic, um, very often they will say, we try to speak as standard as possible. We try to leave out the very regional and colloquial forms. Um, but then at the same time, you will find other families who, who have a certain pride in their regional dialects, because here in, in a city like Manchester that is so diverse, um, there is, of course, also a certain aim to um, maintain a sense of pride and identity that is based on um, the place of origin. So in a way, a globalized city will also um, create situations where people celebrate their sense of identity and also their very regional dialects. Yeah. Um, but it's the modern standard Arabic um, won't be spoken in any family um, in a very natural way. Yeah, of course. So one one thing that's also interesting here is, um, you know, the idea of maintaining, you know, like Arabic, what variety is actually being maintained, right? Is it the home uh, variety that is being maintained or is it the standard Arabic that is being maintained? And on top of that, you have classical Arabic, which is the sacred language of the Quran, you know. Presumably, you would think that the prestige of, standard Arabic would lead, you know, the next generations, you know, to uh, maintain or like keep learning one form of Arabic. But obviously what, you've te what you're telling us is that the situation is actually not that straightforward, right, in, uh, you know, in the different settings that you've looked at. Very, very interesting. If we move to the business uh, world very quickly, because you also looked at the business setting, now, if you walk around Manchester, you'll see, you know, Arabic on different signs, you know, in businesses. What does it really mean? You know, and you did the research on that. Why? Like, you know, what, what do you learn from that kind of research? Well, first of all, um, I was speaking about the, 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 the language data sets, language census, for example, at the beginning. And I was saying how, how it's sometimes we, we, we need to rely on those data sets to get an idea of the language is spoken and used in a, in a particular place. But often they're outdated. Often they don't capture the complexity of the language situation. And they, they kind of try and generalize, give a generalized picture, but they don't necessarily um, offer insights into the dynamics and the quick changes, um, for example, through, through migration. Now, linguistic landscapes, that's a term that's used in sociolinguistics um, to refer to written language use on signs, on, on handwritten notes, on billboards, and so on. Um, and um, linguistic landscapes, writing in the public space, gives us an idea of, of the dynamics, of the quick changes of language use in the city, um, of the very small, um, often, so, often um, so-called smaller languages used in the city that they're not necessarily picked up by larger data sets. And, and also it can give us an idea of the ways in which people um, continue to use their heritage languages in a setting where these languages are not necessarily recognized as a skill locally, not necessarily recognized in mainstream schools, for example. Pupils may be multilingual, speak so many languages every day, but this is not a skill recognized in, in their everyday lives. But then if you look at linguistic landscapes, the written languages that we can see, you can see that those languages are in fact very relevant to, to, to individuals and to, to communities in the city. Um, so linguistic landscapes research offers us to offers insights in, into the various functions of language. 
for commercial reasons, for identity related reasons and, and for communication. Um, and through that, we can pick up really on, on these um, dynamic changes, but also on, on you know, the various uh, the, the power of language in a way to connect people and um, to, to create a sense of identity. But it also shows the presence of a language in a city, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, when we were talking about, you know, um, when I ask how uh, multilingual Manchester is, if you just came to the city, never spoke to anyone, if you walked around just by looking at, you know, uh, the use of language sign, it shows you that there is actually Chinese is here. If you go to Chinatown, for example, you can see Arabic, maybe other languages that I don't know, you know. And um, if we come back to Arabic, what version of Arabic is actually put on uh, signage? Is it classical or do you have varieties? What kind of variation do you have in the use of language in signage? If you've looked at it, of course. That's an interesting question. Well, typically um, the variety that's um, written is the modern standard Arabic variety. So if you see Arabic on shop signs, then, and for example, it's information about products or services that, that a particular outlet offers, then it will most likely be in, in modern standard Arabic. Um, if, if the information is given in, in Arabic. Um, now, what you will also see is, um, for example, re in residential areas, you might see houses, private houses, um, that um, carry signs um, at their facades or also shops um, with, with quotes from the Quran, for example. And these will be in classical Arabic. Um, so often you, you will see um, butchers, for example, Muslim butchers across the city um, that indicate their compliance with Islamic um, dietary requirements, for example. Um, halal meat, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly, or they, they quote um, they quote certain um, parts from the Quran, um, and that will be in classical Arabic. Okay, fantastic. So, um, again, like, you know, uh, the presence of language is one thing, but if we actually, if the opposite happens, you know, that means a language can be banned from public uh, spaces. And that did that does happen in the world, you know, and generally, you know, it happens in context of oppression, for example, or of, um, you know, minoritizing certain groups. And uh, yeah, so you can see how important it is to actually recognize, you know, uh, the presence of a language. It's a way of recognizing the community, you know, the presence of a community, I think. That's a very interesting and very important point. Yes, um, it is, for example, it, it's, it's um, language use on signs might sound very trivial, tri trivial, but it's very, it can be um, very relevant, as you oh. say, for example, in settings where certain languages or groups are oppressed or then um, at the same time, um, just next door in Wales, um, uh, we have a situation, for example, where, where Welsh um, has been revitalized. Um, there has been a language policy that promotes the use of Welsh. Um, and a, a very central part was um, a policy that requires the inclusion of Welsh um, on public science. And that has definitely helped um, promote and revitalize the language um, in Wales. So in this sense, um, yes, linguistic landscapes um, can be of great relevance to people, um, but also to governments. I mean, before we move on to the importance of all this, we can actually look at it even in education. So, you know, in a different setting. So when we were in school, even before my generation in like, you know, Senegal, in most African Francophone countries, African languages were banned from, you know, um, the school, you know, area. So if you were caught speaking um, an African language, you were punished for it. So that's like, you know, in terms of fast signage, the languages were completely absent. But, you know, in terms of like, accept, like, you know, acceptance, let's say, um, you know, the language were, comp the languages were excluded. Gugi Wachungo has actually written on, on that you know, about Kenya. And that's something that we've seen throughout uh, the African continent. One of the consequences is that people grow up with a sense of shame, you know, or a sense of, 
they grow up a little bit disconnected from their language of heritage, which we talked about language maintenance. It does not really help language maintenance. But one other thing that it doesn't also help is, you know, learning. You know, we talked about supplementary schools, but if a child doesn't learn, you know, in the language they understand most, for example, in the question of education, you know, that means they're disadvantaged compared to other children who learn, you know, using the language or the languages they understand better. So let's move to one million dollar question. What is the importance of this kind of research for society? Yes. So this is one of the issues that linguists struggle with, right? We don't struggle with it because we don't know what, you know, uh, what the importance is, but because the general public, many people don't actually know what linguists do and what the importance of linguistic research is, you know, to education and socioeconomic development and access to resources. So, you know, we are lucky to have you here because you've done quite, you know, unique work, you know, in that area. So could you tell us a little bit about, you know, about that? Thank you. Yeah, I think, well, I think that the wider importance of um, my work or, or the work um, of colleagues who, who are do doing similar um, research in my field is to first and foremost challenge um, and problematize the categories that too often we take for granted. And I'm referring to particularly language categories. So uh, of course, in the public discourse, um, we, we don't want to abolish the use um, of categories such as Arabic or, or Chinese or English. Um, but where it gets problematic is when those kind of categories are used um, as a basis to plan and um, define provisions, for example. Um, we were speaking about the, the great linguistic variation, for example, with uh, Arabic. And um, if you're trying to, to offer um, interpreting services, for example, for, for a very diverse population in, in, a, in a globalized diaspora setting, such as Manchester, where so many different varieties of Arabic are spoken, many of them are not mutually intelligible, um, then it's very difficult to just um, provide language provision um, for someone who is an Arabic speaker when you don't have information about um, a particular regional variety for example and this what kind of Arabic they speak exactly and this is this is often very problematic and can really lead to, to a breakdown in communication and um, for example in the healthcare setting this can be fatal um, so that is one of the areas where um, through our research we can um, point to the complexities of linguistic variation and to the need um, to to be more informed um, of the, the, I mean, we're not expecting um, people working in public services to be linguists and to be experts in all those languages that they, they provide language provisions for. But through our research, we can help um, provide information that will um, help in turn um, provide better language services and overcome communication difficulties in a city um, that is diverse, such as Manchester. Um, and a very similar situation is for supplementary schools, as we spoke about before, there's this complexity of um, related to decision making processes, really, of which language variety to teach or not to teach in a school um, that tries to, to pass on heritage and language. And um, here our research can offer indications of how to deal with um, having various dialects in the classroom, for example, um, rather than telling students off when they use their regional varieties that they picked up in the home. How can we celebrate the diversity um, of you dialects that we have in the classroom? Yeah, and, and somehow um, support young children and, and also adults how to deal with, with these challenges in a diverse setting, for example. I think it's in the healthcare sector, um, you know, you can see the importance of this research in the healthcare sector. If you use an interpreter, of, uh, you know, um, a Syrian interpreter for Algerian Arabic, for example, I don't know how mutually intelligible these varieties are, 
but you know for a fact that they are different. The wrong translation can lead to like medical errors, I would suppose, you know, and uh, I mean, you don't want to imagine what happens after that, right? So it's really important, you know, to uh, see, you know, like who, you know, the service user is, who the service provider is, and who the interpreter is before, you know, a decision is made. Um, and that leads us to one question, the question of community, because we talked about, we often talk about the Arabic community, right? But we've just seen that even within what is generally referred to as community, there are, let's say, sub-communities, right? So, and you've done research on like, actually the concept of communities that problematize the concept of community. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, the issues uh, and what you found? Yeah, well, community is one of the most highly contested concepts in sociolinguistics. And we, we continue to use it again in public discourse, of course. Um, but it's also often used um, in political um, discourse and documents and so on, speaking about the neighborhood communities or immigrant communities, Arabic communities and so on. And we've been speaking a lot today about the great linguistic variation that we can find, for example, for Arabic. So um, I hope um, I've managed to kind of um, give a picture of how difficult it is to, to speak of an Arabic community, for example, when there is so many varieties of Arabic, but also um, when beyond the Arab world, so many um, people and groups um, associate themselves or align with Arabic for a variety of reasons. And we can find similar situations with other languages um, where there is a certain alignment with the language for, for historical reasons and so on, or in, in post-colonial settings, of course, and so on. So it's very difficult to, to um, pinpoint what a community actually is. And um, also after my research, there is no one um, clear definition that I would say that's the right definition and that's how we should use the term. But um, what my research shows is that it's very, very important to be aware of the, very, the various complexities of the term oh. and that we shouldn't use um, it as a category or, as, or in our research as a unit of analysis where you, um, you base your research on one community and um, understand that as the group of speakers, for example, that you're studying just based on one language that they speak. Um, communities um, can be practiced, um, communities can be imagined. There's been a lot of research done um, prior to my own research, looking at the various aspects in which people imagine and experience or perform community in various ways of community. And then obviously the importance of understanding that um, we often feel a sense of um, membership um, with multiple communities at the same time. It might be the community of my family, um, of work, of uh, football or music and so on. Linguists. Exactly. And, and, and language is, is, is one of the aspects. And also, of course, understandings of community um, are changing rapidly with, with the changes in, in communication technology, with increased global connections really um yes. so it is important to to um not take for granted that community is something that we can easily define um and use as a category in our research but also um in political discourse for example yeah i think in complex urban or national or like even in you know, rural you know, um, in more cosmopolitan places, it's a concept that becomes much more problematic than areas where you have like smaller, but less, which is actually harder to find nowadays, but uh, places that are less complex in terms of, you know, uh, ethnic, you know, um, let's say uh, makeup you know, of the society. But obviously with movement, people, obviously grow new communities. So yes, it's a, it's a very complex uh, applied to the, you know, to the communities that we see in Manchester in your research. 
I think it's probably a good lesson for maybe policymakers to learn, uh, to think about what kind of, what do they mean when they talk about, you know, communities. Yeah, and that, that is really important, particularly when thinking about the kinds of provisions um, that people define and imagine for, for diverse city and for communities. And again, it relates to, to the provision, for example, of interpreting and translation services. Um, this is much more complex than it might seem um, at first sight. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, let's move to a, a question that is probably useful for linguists and for burgeoning scholars who would like to do research, uh, you know, on multilingualism in urban contexts or even rural contexts, um, linguistic landscape. So you've collected data, you know, in Manchester in a very complex setting. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you did it? That's more like a field work question, right, for, for linguists. <laughs> But even for non-linguists, it's important to see actually how, you know, uh, we do our research. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, for our um, listeners and viewers to understand, um, my research is based in what's often um, referred to as ethnography. So I'm um, I'm applying. Um, what you could call experience-based methods to try and, and um, immerse myself in the um, communities that I'm studying um, over a long period of time. Um, so, for example, I, I across different settings in the city of Manchester, I tried um, to, to participate in the practices of the places that I was studying. Um, so, for example, I was um, a learner of Arabic and still am, um, but I, I was over a period of one and a half years or so, I was um, a language learner, an Arabic learner in one of the supplementary schools. So every Saturday I experienced life as a participant in the classroom, what it was like to be learning the language in the very diverse diaspora setting. Um, Arabic or, or which variety did you learn? That's a very good question. As a learner, as a non-heritage. Well, classic or maybe standard? Uh, yes, as a non-heritage learner of Arabic, um, my teachers certainly wanted me to learn modern standard Arabic. Modern standard Arabic. And um, that's actually a very interesting question um, because my perspective as a language learner very often created interesting opportunities to, to ask um, teachers and almost challenge them about the, these decisions, why I should um, learn the modern standard variety and why I can't learn the regional colloquial forms that everyone actually around me was using. Um, so this created very interesting opportunities really to learn about language attitudes and ideologies. Um, Students are trying to design the curriculum. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so in, in my roles as language learner and researcher, I also did a placement, for example, um, over several months. Um, I, I, I was able to observe language practices and um, also do interviews, for example, focus groups, in, group interviews, um, but also observe how, how languages were used in speaking and in writing um, in many, many different ways and many settings. And a very important part um, of my research, but also in, in ethnography, is, is um, to reflect on, on our practices as researcher and to reflect on our positionings, to be able to understand um, how my own um, perspective, for example, might influence the ways in which I observe and, and interpret um, other people's practices and statements about language use, for example, um, and that is relevant, particularly when you're looking at um, identity, community, um, language attitudes and, and ideologies and so on. Because the important thing here is to uh, discover the categories you're looking at, but from the community's perspective, mm -hmm. not from like, you know, uh, the, let's say it can be the researcher's perspective, but they shouldn't be set from the beginning of the study before you go into the community. So, yeah, exactly. so that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a very important uh, 
uh, point that you're making. If I see, uh, a, let's say a Libyan restaurant with um, written on uh, Arabic, you know, uh, or Roman script, like what's the difference? Like, I mean, there's a difference, obviously, a, vis a visual difference, but, you know, in terms of authenticity, I suppose, do clients react? I, I'm, I'm not sure you looked at the clients bit, but, you know, can you tell us a little bit about it if you have done some work in that? Of course, industry? of course. I mean, there, there's various perspectives or various ways to look at this. As you say, you can look at the clients and ways in which people perceive that. And for example, if, if you, um, or my own experience, for example, of walking through Chinatown, let's say, where I can't, I can't read Chinese characters, um, sometimes you will find pinyin or transliterations of these characters and um, into, into Latin or Roman script. And for me, being able to understand, to be able to read that, pronounce it, of course, gives me a different kind of access to when I just see the Chinese characters that mm -hmm. might help create a sense of authenticity, but not necessarily allow me access, um, allow me understand how to pronounce the name of a particular restaurant, for example. And these are the various perspectives and, and factors that you can look at. And then also I was speaking about identity and, and creation of identity through language use before. And that of course also plays a role when, when, when you, you ask um, shop owners, for example, about uh, language or script choice um, for their signs and their facades. Um, the use of a particular language or alphabet or script might um, help create a particular sense of identity or might help create a link to one to someone's place of origin so there's many many ways of looking at this and of course there will be different perspectives and different um understandings and interpretations of what this means for an individual it always depends really on on someone's um what we call language repertoire on, on someone's um proficiencies in particular languages or um, abilities to 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 read um a language or a script or not. Thank you very much, Dr. Leoni Geiser. It was a really, really nice conversation. We could go on for like another hour, but I think we have come to the end of our episode. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot from uh, you know uh, uh, your research and linguistic landscape and multilingualism in Manchester. And I hope uh, the viewers have also learned a lot, especially what linguists do, what is the importance of our research. Thank you very much and see you. Uh, before we go, where can you find uh, your research? And uh, um, can we contact you? Where is, uh, you know, where is your research? Where can we find your research? Sorry. <laughs> so as you mentioned before, I'm currently a postdoctoral um, research associate at the University of Manchester, and I'm also a member of the Linguistic Diversity Collective um, that you can easily find um, on Google or on social media, um, Linguistic Diversity Collective, and um, there will always be updates um, about our research and, and the research of colleagues in the department. Thank you once again. See Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Okay. I enjoyed it.